good evening, everyone. Uh, the talk to date is about experimental design. Now, the, the, my point here in the entire talk is that when people submit papers to a journal, uh, uh, it is often too late to do anything about faults in their experimental design. So you have to think about experimental design before you do your experiments. Because it's very sad uh, when someone submits a paper and they're told that their experiments have not been designed properly. And this is the most common cause of rejection of a manuscript, that the experiments have not been designed properly and so there is no point in the editors reviewing the, the manuscript for publication. How do we change that? Okay. okay, so this is not a course in experimental design. I'm not, not a statistician. I'm an editor of a journal. My journal publishes scientific studies that attempt to produce new knowledge in the field of pharmacology. The purpose of this presentation is to emphasize to you the importance of designing your studies properly if you want to publish them. And I hope that this will improve the quality and success of manuscripts that you submit. So, for a journal, the journal's reputation rests on the reliability of the knowledge presented. And we must ensure that anything we publish is going to be reliable. We have a duty to the readers of the journal, and the readers want to add to their knowledge by reading the paper. The knowledge in a paper must be reliable. The reader must be able to trust it, and they must be able to reproduce it as a basis for their own next studies. So they want to acquire knowledge that they can then use for a basis for their own next studies. The journal's reputation may attract readers, but that, that, that's only when they come to start to read the paper. A study must be seen to be reliable. The readers must be given enough information to understand what the author has done so that they can draw their own conclusions from the work that's presented. People can read papers in different ways. Some readers simply believe the conclusions of the authors. They take it and trust that the conclusions are correct. However, many people, myself included, only look at the methods and results and draw their own conclusions. So the myth, sorry. So the methods and results must be robust. They must be strong. They must be correct. It must be possible to trust them, so that they can draw their conclusions from that work. The job of the editor is to help the author to give the required information. The editor has to ensure that the author has set out the questions to be answered, that the author has described the experiments required, and has designed an experimental program that is adequate to answer the questions asked. And finally, although the reader may want to draw their own conclusions, the conclusions drawn by the author must be justified by the experiments that they've done. So the most common cause of rejection of a manuscript is that the experiments have not been designed properly. This is very sad when it reaches this stage that the, uh, the experimenter has 
uh, completed their experiments and has written a paper and then sent it to the journal. But the journal says, we are sorry, but your experiments have not been designed properly, so there is no point in us assessing this any further. It's too late to do anything about it. Now, the most common reasons for rejection are these three. The experiments may not be blinded, there may be no randomization, or there may be inadequate numbers of experiments for proper statistics. Into some detail about those individual uh, aspects. So, when the editors or reviewers point out these faults to the, the authors after the manuscript is submitted, it's too late to do anything about it. So you really must design your experiments properly from the beginning so that you produce results and you produce a manuscript that can be considered for publication. There's a, a saying here uh, that, was, that was made by um, Sir Ronald Fisher, who is probably the most famous statistician um, in science so far, and he said, to consult a statistician after an experiment is finished is often merely to ask him to conduct a post-mortem examination. He can perhaps say what the experiment died of. Now, if you've ever been in this situation, you'll understand what I mean. If you go to a statistician after you've completed your experiments, they will almost always tell you that you haven't done your experiments properly and that you can't do a fair statistical analysis. I personally have been in this situation, and it's extremely annoying. But it can be avoided by going to the statistician before you do your experiments. So Fisher is considered to be the father of modern experimental design. Another thing he said was that experiments are only experience carefully planned in advance and designed to form a secure basis of new knowledge. In other words, you must have, uh, you must have knowledge and experience before you start, and you must use that to plan in advance what you're going to do. And only if you do that can you produce new knowledge, which is a basis for building upon. So, you need to think everything out before doing the experiments. After the experiments, it's too late. You will have wasted your time. So, what this often amounts to is what we call the numbers game. How many experiments do you need to establish a result as true and likely to be reproducible? How do you decide how many experiments to do? This is a general principle. Whatever your experimental test or the field of work, the principle and problems are the same. You're generally comparing sets of values. How do you tell whether they're the same or different? And you often use statistical tests which will provide odds that the two sets of data may be different. Say the odds, you want to have odds of 95% or 99% to be an acceptable proof that you have a difference. Could, could the people who are making a noise mute their microphones, please? There's, there's noise on the line. So, how can you improve the odds to make it easier to find a difference? The odds can be made higher by enlarging the experiment. This is generally always true. You can improve the odds by using greater numbers in a bigger experiment. If the experiment is much smaller, if it's too small, even, even with a very successful small experiment, the odds can be so low that the results might, with considerable probability, be ascribed to chance. So statistics cannot help at this stage if you simply don't have enough experiments, then it may be chance that has produced your result, and it means nothing. 
So you always need to make the experiment as large as you can. So what are the most common crimes of people who get it wrong? Usually this involves incorrect statistical methods. And the first example of that is what we call regression to the mean. And this says that as the experiment is repeated, there may be an early statistical fluke, there may be an early experiment that suggests you have a great difference, but as you do more experiments and you get towards the mean, this gets cancelled out. Some authors like to keep any of the first few results that suit them, and this can be very tempting. You do one or two experiments, you get the result you want, and you think, oh well, that's fine, I'll carry on, and that's, that will have proved my point. But you can't do that. The second thing is what we call significance chasing. And that is, you do some experiments, and the data doesn't give you the result that you wanted, so you keep, uh, you keep on looking for new statistical methods till you find one that gives you significance. This also is terribly silly and, and should be avoided. You should be able to use, in most pharmacological experiments, quite simple statistics uh, to show whether or not there is significance. There's a nice article which I have uh, mentioned here um, by uh, Kustova, who is a senior person working for the National Institutes of Health in the United States. And this very nice uh, presentation on her, on her website uh, gives you many of the factors that you should take into consideration um, in avoiding these crimes uh, of publication. Now, of course, we have to face that in the real world, we can't do an infinite number of experiments. Collecting information is costly. Experiments are costly. Money and staff resources, numbers of subjects are all limited. And ethics may suggest that it's desirable to have fewer animals or human subjects. So you have all these constraints working against you. And time is a major constraint. You can't go on forever trying to prove a scientific point. You always have to weigh the information to be gained against the cost of collection. So there's a cost-benefit analysis that always has to be done. But you shouldn't err on the side of doing too few experiments. In order to avoid this situation, in order to get things right at the beginning, advanced planning and preliminary experiments are essential. The part of this is that you need to know the variability of your data to plan how many of a test you would need in order to detect changes. This is very important. And run Optimization aids this by reducing the variability between groups. And I'll explain what I mean by that. Randomization. Random assignment spreads out differences between subjects in an unsystematic, random way. So there's no tendency to give an edge or an advantage to any group. This is a way of making sure that you are
Otherwise, you may subconsciously choose data that suits your prejudice. So you must never uh, uh, analyze with a knowledge of which group you're dealing with. And basic pharmacology, this mainly involves a couple of, of typical examples. First of all, there's the random assignment of animals or experimental samples to groups that will receive different treatment. So this is at the beginning of the experiment, you must uh, make up your groups in a random way and then give them the treatment. You mustn't uh, simply uh, choose, choose animals or, or samples, um, uh, say on the basis of the first ones that you can take out of the cage. Uh, you must always randomly assign the animals of experimental samples. And you can do this by uh, tossing a coin, by throwing a dice, or by uh, using something more systematic like uh, computer-generated tables of random numbers. And all of these things will give you uh, a method for randomly assigning animals or samples to different groups. And secondly, at the, the uh, other end of the experiment is the anonymous labeling of samples uh, whose analysis requires an element of judgment. For example, if the experimenter is measuring something down a microscope or is deciding uh, qualitatively what, what is the nature of something that they, they must not know that they see, then they must not know uh, which group they're looking at because otherwise they may be subconsciously uh, prejudiced. And this is, again, very important. And then in human studies, double blinding is required because the subject and the researcher both need to be blinded to the nature of the treatment or intervention. Uh, very bad, that's deplorable, but that's not the important point. The more important point is that the conclusions reached may be wrong and the data is misleading. The important point here is, is that, the, the, that you're, you're creating bad foundations either for yourselves or for future uh, scientists building on your work. So you really, you really have to avoid that, and journals have to try to ensure that this is avoided by their authors. Now, other experimental design failures that cause rejection of a manuscript, um, probably the most important one is that the number of observations made is too small. And as I mentioned before, this can be done to save resources, but is a false economy because it will produce the wrong answer. There are two different types of the number of observations being too small. The first is just not doing enough experiments.
the second way in which small numbers uh, can be is easily seen by the reviewer as being incorrect but it's amazing how many authors will argue that they number of observations. Respect the proper statistics or more bad science will result. Now estimating the size of sample that you need, as you can see in that previous example I've been implying that n equals 3 is not good and in most circumstances n equals 3 definitely is not good, but in any particular situation you must find out how big a sample size you need in order to uh, get a reliable statistical uh, analysis. Now this is crucial, but it's also difficult. It involves a lot of judgment, and I can't sit here tonight and tell you what exact number you need to do, because it depends on the nature of your experiments. Preliminary experiments, however, if they are done, will show how much variability there is in your normals. Then again, you can't only rely on the variability within your normal samples because your tests have been altered by some intervention, maybe more variable. So your initial preliminary experiments may need to involve test samples as well as normals. In this situation, people often use uh, what are called power calculations. Now, power calculations are now required by many granting bodies, the people who provide money for experiments, which may be government bodies or they may be charities or industrial companies. And increasingly, Granting bodies require you to do power calculations to establish how many experiments you need to do to provide uh, reliable data. This is obviously in their interest because they don't want to give money to people to do experiments which are going to be inadequate. And power calculations are usually available uh, in, in many statistical packages uh, and are quite simple uh, to do. Now, up till now, the, although the people who provide the money to do the experiments have required power calculations, journals have not necessarily asked if this is done. But increasingly, as 
uh, transparency of experimentation becomes important and, and uh, journals are realising the importance of people doing their experimental design improperly. It's becoming a publication requirement. So you may be asked by journals to justify the number of experiments that you're doing by doing a power calculation. And even if you're not required to do it, this is a good thing to do because it justifies the numbers that you have employed. There are all sorts of complications come in at this point. For example, what difference would you be satisfied with if you want to find difference between two groups? Are you satisfied with a difference of 10% or 20% or do you require a greater difference? And this again is something that the calculation will tell you how many you need to determine a difference of this size, but you have to decide what's actually important in your biological experiment. And that's again something that requires judgment uh, and, uh, and something that you must, uh, you must work out in advance. So how do you avoid these mistakes? Well, you avoid these mistakes by educating yourself a little. You need to learn a little about the principles of experimental design. And there are many sources of the principles of experimental design on websites and in textbooks. And in my view, for biological scientists, the first chapter of a book on experimental design is usually enough. Beyond that, you probably find yourself getting uh, involved in, in complicated discussions that are really of no interest to you. But if you get the grasp, the basics of experimental design, then you can find the statistics appropriate to your own work. There are lots of examples on the internet, and this example I've given here is a good simple introduction. It's actually quite an old paper uh, that, that someone not the author, someone has put on the internet because they think it's a very clear explanation of the principles of experimental design. And I found it very easy to, to, to read, so I can recommend this to you. So, as well as learning about experimental design, as I've said, once you've learned about experimental design, then you need to learn something about the basic principles of statistics. You shouldn't just accept that the statistics used before um, are adequate. Don't just copy what's done before, because sometimes what's been done before is, is not done well. Just because it's published, it doesn't mean it's good. Standards are continually improving. So... I'll give you an example here of a good readable guide to statistics that are required in pharmacology. We've published this in over the last couple of years online in British Journal of Pharmacology. The author's name is Drummond, uh, Gordon Drummond from the University of Edinburgh, and the series is called Best Practice in Statistical Reporting. And this is the, uh, the web address at the bottom of the page. It's a series of 15 short articles. They're all very simple to read. You can, you can read one of these articles in, in 15, 20 minutes, and each one of them covers a specific area that's needed in pharmacology in an accessible way. So you can learn one principle at a time. So when you, you open up that web link, you'll go to a page on the, on the, the web page for the journal here, which is the, the uh, collection of articles in statistical reporting, and then you can click on the individual articles um, and read them. For example, the first one explains the basis for the series uh, uh, 
and, is, and just reproduces an article that's been published in the journal. So, what further advice can we give? <laughs> well, there's really a few simple principles that you can uh, you can employ, employ. Probably my uh, firmest recommendation is that you should not use statistical so software unless you understand the principles behind it. There is nothing worse than using software that turns out to be inappropriate for your data. So I cannot emphasize too strongly that you should look at your data. Don't just shove it into the computer and expect it to give you some magical answer. You need to look at the data, look at the numbers, and think for yourself how you might find differences between two sets of it, for example. And there's a, a, a comment here from uh, an Australian scientist called Michael Wu, and he said, the choice of how to express the data is very important and should not be made solely on the basis of habit or convention. Always inspect the data in its raw form. Always look at your data. And he's written a couple of quite nice, simple uh, papers on this, again published in British Journal of Pharmacology. One of them is called Good Statistical Practice in Pharmacology, and the other one is called Bad Statistical Practice in Pharmacology. So this gives you a, an idea of what you should do and, and things that you should avoid. And finally, uh, what I've been emphasizing throughout this is that after you have done your experiments is not the point to be thinking of experimental design. You must consider experimental design and statistical analysis and take any advice on that before you do your experiments. And then once you've designed and conducted your study and before you write your article, you should consult the author guidelines for the particular journal that you're hoping to submit to. Because another great crime is that you don't write your paper in the way that the author guidelines or instructions to authors recommend. And that is a very sure way to have your paper rejected at the start. So consult the author guidelines before starting to write your manuscript. And if you're doing good science, I hope that you will submit it to our journal, British Journal of Pharmacology, and this is a website for the instructions to authors. So all that's left to say is good luck in writing your, uh, your papers. Thank you.